Okay, we're good to go. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome, uh, everyone who's joining us for our Ask a Non-Autistic Person panel. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank Anthem, our sponsor. Um, we really appreciate their sponsoring this panel, their generous support, and obviously their sense of humor. Um, this is a panel that I am so excited about where we are really going to learn to see the condition of tragically not being autistic from the inside out in a new way and gain understanding, awareness, and maybe, who knows, maybe even acceptance for the lives and actions of these mysterious, bewildering, yet surprisingly awesome folks known as non-autistic people. Before we get started, I just want to give a little bit of context for this panel. Um, this concept comes from Autreat, which is sort of the classic autistic conference. They used to have a panel called Ask an NT, with NT meaning neurotypical. We decided to change the title to Ask a Non-Autistic Person just to be a little bit more inclusive. You may have heard the saying, if you've met one non-autistic person, you've met one non-autistic person. Um, and I find that that's just so true. Um, Non-autistic people aren't just a monolithic group of eye contact loving social interaction hackers like so many people assume. And not all of them are neurotypical, hence Ask a Non-Autistic Person. There are two purposes to this panel. One is to ask the genuine questions that so many autistic people wish we could ask non-autistic people, but can't find anyone to ask. And the other purpose is to be funny by talking about not being autistic in the way that popular culture talks about autism. So if I seem to be making some overly stereotypical statements, that's why. If you're autistic and you love The Bachelor, or if you're not autistic but you hate eye contact, I promise I do know you're out there. If I sound like I'm trafficking in generalizations, please know it's only for comedy purposes. All right. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful panelists now. Um, panelists, as I'm asking questions, not everyone has to answer every question, but feel free to jump in if something speaks to you. Um, let's start here. Um, we've all brought you here, as you know, to be self-narrating zoo exhibits. So why don't you start by telling us your story, Does, and not leaving out any of the heartbreaking details of not being autistic. Um, let's start actually with, when did you know that you were not autistic? You know, this is Patrick, I'll lead off. You know, I, I, I think it was at a very young age where I realized that I had no propensity for any of the autism related superhero tactics. I'm rubbish at math. Uh, I was unable to keep a running catalog of random items in my memory. I love looking people deeply in their eyes, even though I have, <laughs> which makes it very difficult. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think it's also interesting because there's so many behaviors um, that our society is so interested in marking as autistic. And yet there are things that everybody does. And it's a little silly. Like, you know, people talk about, um, you know, using the same phrases at work. I used to work with people where they literally said the same thing after every weekend. Hey, Bob, how, how was your weekend? You, hey, Bob, <laughs> working hard or hardly working? Oh, can't complain, Greg. Nobody would listen if you did every single day. Now, if that's not, uh, that falls out of the realm of neurotypical behavior, in my opinion, and yet that just was collegial banter. What a good point. Yeah, it's, I can understand also that like, it might be, you know, maybe some non-autistic people are getting missed or not diagnosed as non-autistic if they're doing those behaviors that could be seen as scripting or as, as something that one would consider more autistic. Um, what a great point from Patrick. Um, anyone else want to weigh in? Uh, when did you know you were non-autistic? Well, this is Maria. I'll weigh in. Uh, you know, I didn't always know what autism was. Um, but as soon as I knew what autism was, I knew that I wasn't autistic. Um, and it's interesting because um, while I am not autistic, I do identify as neurodiverse. Uh, I have cerebral palsy, another developmental disability, and it was always so funny to me. One, um, like many autistic people, I was labeled as high functioning. And so uh, people would say, oh, you have cerebral palsy. I would never know. You can do so much. 
you, your mind is amazing. And I would always um, be very confused by that response because it is actually um, my mind that, you know, is the primary cause of my disability. Um, and so it was, it was really interesting that once I did know what autism was, um, I knew that that wasn't me and that was fine. Um, but when I learned the vocabulary of neurodiversity, um, I, I actually, it was an amazing day because I found, I found something that fit, um, that wasn't centered in a diagnostic category. Um, and also I, I gained this other vocabulary to understand myself, which is, um, I stim. Like one of the things that I get really worried about now is that I will forget to turn my camera off and like whoever I'm meeting with will see me stimming in like my full glory. And that is very much due to my sparkly CP mind. Um, and like, I have to be careful. Like I cannot listen to the Hamilton soundtrack when I have serious stuff to do because I get like too sensory overloaded and like can't process anything else. So, um, you know, I. Knowing I wasn't autistic was a fine day, but realizing that I was neurodiverse and having access to the language of stimming was really a proud day for me. Thank you, Maria. I think it is so inspiring to think about what connects us as autistic people and non-autistic people. You know, we really are sometimes more alike than different. Um, that's Absolutely. such a valuable insight. Thank you. Um, <laughs> anyone else want to weigh in before we move into the rest of our questions? <laughs> Emily, I would be happy to weigh in. Um, you know, I cannot put my finger on exactly the tragic day that I found out that I was non-autistic or as someone might say, a diagnostician that I am very low functioning when it comes to being autistic. Um, you know, so unfortunate. Um, I think that for me, there was always the assumption when I was younger that there was one type of disability and it was physical and that's what you have. But quote, your mind is fine. It's just your legs that don't work. And, you know, that was always what I was told. And so as I was growing up, I was like, well, the old brain works good, so I'm doing okay. And uh, it took quite a while for me to realize that that was not in fact how you should be looking at the world. Um, you know, but it was, it was a very unfortunate upbringing that I had where I was just told repeatedly that I was high functioning. How rude of everyone. Absolutely everyone. Terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on to so, our next question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll chime in a bit. This is Elena. And just thinking about when we knew it's so interesting to hear Patrick and me and when we talk about this, I think I always knew I wasn't non-autistic, but didn't have the words for it. Like I didn't know the term non-autistic, right? Um, I look around and I, um, a little bit of background on me. I have three sisters and I kind of confused, I think, looking back with my other identities. I grew up Chinese, I am Chinese and Catholic. And we had this communication issue. We didn't really always, talk about what we were exactly thinking and so I was like is this the Chinese culture where we don't talk about it is it the Catholic piece is it the non-autistic piece where I just can't <laughs> say what we mean and you know my sisters and I spent all of our childhood just guessing what we needed um going back and forth and so you know so I think I knew at a young age but I didn't really know no you know. That's so, thank you for bringing that up because we talk so often about um, the cultural context and diagnosis, um, but I really think when we talk about being non-autistic, we're missing that piece. Um, and definitely I've had people that I know bring that up as well. Um, so like uh, growing up in a culture where the norm is to guess, um, it makes it, it's hard to know as, as someone being a non-autistic person or is that just the cultural context they're coming from? So absolutely. Um, for my next question, how are you? Is that a good neurotypical voice? How are you? Um, and when you ask us how we are, is it true that you don't really want to know? So can I take this right away? Because I just want to sure. clarify for everyone. It's not a question. You know, I think you're asking, how are you question mark? It's really, how are you period? Like, it's just a statement. Huh. Hi, how are you? Period. So I'm not really 
asking for something in return. It's just, hey, how's it going? How are you? Period. Period. See, it's it's interesting though because this falls in line. This is Patrick again. Is this falls in line with that weird thing we were talking about that you could almost argue is as uh it's more of it of a vocal exercise. You know the way that you might do something to calm yourself down in an unfamiliar uh, experience or. So the question is totally meaningless. It's just to say, hey, how are you doing? I'm fine. Oh, vocal exercise complete. Now I feel like I have control over this myriad world that is whirling out of control at any given moment. This is a like, wow. I think it depends. I think usually the often the first time for me, it's that. And then sometimes in, later in the conversation, I'll even have even forgotten that we went through that because it was so meaningless. And then I'll ask again, so how are you? Or how are you doing? Um, so usually often for me, there's that distinction between the, the, social, the social ritual and then the actual question. And I also just wanna add on the last question. Um, you know, For me, even though I did realize at a certain point that I wasn't autistic, I've just been so grateful to be you know, so included in autistic community and that I felt such a warm welcome and that um, my, my autistic friends, including here at ASAN, have tried so hard not to make me feel left out because of my non-autistic identity. You know, I, I would Aww. like to concur with Allegra. You know, I, you know, you guys, a lot of us have kids. I have three. We gave them all their vaccines and none of them ended up being autistic. I had the same conversation Aww. with my brain. And, Aren't you so you know, disappointed? We tried the best we could. I don't know what else yeah. to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, Allegra, thank you for bringing up inclusion. I think that's a really great point, um, making sure that non-autistic people um, have access to autistic community and feel fully included in spite of their tragic differences. Um, but also, these are fantastic insights that I'm getting about the question, how are you, which has often puzzled me. Um, so just to recap for our, our autistic attendees, um, this could be considered sort of a, a scripting or even an attention-seeking behavior. Um, but it's really just, you know, it's a, it's a quirk of, of neurotypical culture. Um, and the way you can tell whether they want you to answer honestly or not is whether they're asking it a second time or only once. First time, it's a script. Second time, answer honestly. Loving this life hack. I think that could honestly work out really well. Zoe, can All I right. add something um, very quickly? Yeah, yeah. So I, I just want to make sure everyone knows that there are actually variations. So how's it hanging? Oh. How's it going? How you feeling? All the same thing. Not actually a question you need to answer. Really scripting some kind of vocal exercise or social ritual that requires a not like not really a response. Oh, wow. That's so advanced and complex. Thank you. I really appreciate that insight. You're welcome. Um, so as non autistic people, um, I understand that all of you, of course, have a severe deficit in the ability to say what you mean. And we've been talking a little bit about that. Um, but I just want to ask, how do you cope with that in your life? Um, must, that must create complications. So how, how, do you, how do you compensate for that? Or how do you deal with that? Allegra, I know you had mentioned this earlier. Oh, yeah. Um, thanks for asking about that, that, Zoe. It is a challenge. I mean, I think that among non-autistic people, I've known as fairly direct, but still, um, it's a barrier that I've had to overcome. So one time um, we were having a house meeting in my cooperative house of about eight people, and there was a discussion of whether we could let someone with a cat move in. And some people were very anti-cat, shared their feelings at great length. And I was very pro-cat, and so tried to share my feelings about how much I would like a cat in the house, but went so far to try to validate the feelings of the people who were anti-cat and see, share that I could see their point of view and have the conversation go smoothly, that it came away with people not having any idea that I actually wanted a cat in the house. <gasps> um, and I only found that out later in follow-up conversations. And so, yeah, I've, in conversations since then, I just had to really, you know, try to, um, try to cut back on some of that behavior and try to be more clear about what I mean. This oh is my goodness. Really, um, I'll just say that, you know, not being able to say directly what you mean is a real big problem when it comes to relationships. Um, you know, when you are dating someone and you are in fact very annoyed about something, but then they ask you and you're like, it's fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. It's not actually fine, but since I am not autistic and have no capability to say what I'm actually thinking. I'm just going to tell you I'm fine. And then I'm going to suppress it and do nothing about it. <laughs> yeah. I wondered how people deal with that. 
you know, we might need some kind of like a, a documentary series to explore the love and dating problems faced by non-autistic people. Maybe we could call it love off of the spectrum. <laughs> I think that would be really worth doing. But isn't this what uh, the anyone else wanna... is for? Oh, yeah. You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because we did get a question submitted about that. We had our viewers submit questions. Um, and one of them was, why is The Bachelor or The Bachelorette so interesting to people who are tragically lacking autism? Um, I would love any insight here. I think it's because some people really like to communicate their feelings just with flowers. And I personally <laughs> have the same, the same difficulty where it doesn't I'll, even if I get a flower, I'm like, what did she mean by that? This is a red rose. Are we friends? Is it yellow? I'm, I'm so unsure. Huh. And what does That's plants fit into that? You know, there's flowers, plants, all the different kinds of flowers. Well, you see, flowers are yet another way that we get around saying what we actually feel. We even have a whole code mm -hmm. for flowers, right? Yellow rose yeah. means friendship, red rose means romance, white rose means sadness. I mean, we I didn't know these. I feel like I'm missing out on some of the social cues I should know as an autistic person. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I, can, I can send you a book. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. like, uh, flower bending is a, is a pretty, pretty significant subject. I feel I, I did not get like proper social training not? as a non autistic because I did not wow. know that white meant sadness either. Where was this my social behavioral training? Because yeah. we're seeing right now in real time a group of non-autistic people who don't all have the same social information and really having to like hash that out. Um, I just got a message, Zoe, can we see your cat? I don't have a cat with me, um, but you are welcome to take a look at my dog. <laughs> She's right here. Her name is Katie Spoon. Say hi. She's asleep, um, but that's Katie. Um, if we have sufficiently covered The Bachelor, I have a really pressing question um, that is often on my mind, and that's, what is the deal with eye contact? Is it fun? Does it, can you read people's minds? Because from the way non-autistic people talk about eye contact, I'm pretty sure it lets you read people's minds. Is that right? Have I got this right? <laughs> I've seen some nods, tentative nods. You know, you know what, interestingly enough, yeah, you know, if you look at the way that we talk about eye contact, like in media and in literature, there is an insinuation that somehow you are reading or gaining access to a person's intentions based on yeah. maintain or don't maintain eye contact with you. And in, in all seriousness, there's a, there's a definite argument, a cultural argument, especially in the Western world that that eye contact somehow denotes that. I'll tell you an interesting story. When I was in college, I had a close friend uh, who was a pre-frosh. So I like got to know her pretty well, brought her into our, our honors association and she's Pakistani. And what she said, and what we realized was maybe by about like the second year she was at Howard with us, we knew her pretty well, but that she didn't make eye contact with me because I was a man and any mm -hmm. of my friends, even though we were close, I mean, we'd been, We'd gone to Puerto Rico together. She taught us all the salsa. Like we were actual friends. And she was like, no, like culturally it's an intimacy thing. You don't share that intimacy with anyone else. And I remember sort of like turning that over a little bit. And then I was sort of thinking, well, like, I, I guess, I guess that fits in. So, so it's, it's just sort of weird because then what it means is that some of our discussions about eye contact aren't even sort of like autistic or neurotypical lens. They're like this weird Western business model that we've taught ourselves is important. And I don't, I don't even really know anymore if it is. Yeah, absolutely. And like also speaking seriously, I see people when they're talking about autism say things like eye contact is the pinnacle of human interaction or something like, like in seriousness, people will say this. And these are always like, you know, white people like from England or from the US or um, someplace where eye contact is like a, a normative requirement, um, who sort of don't even realize that the other cultures and other places have different norms around this. Um, and they're just like assuming that what is culturally and based on their, you know, not having autism works for them, doesn't work for other people, whether or not they're autistic, just based on their cultural context. 
Or they I do realize uh, that it fits their white supremacist worldview. That as well. I would like to, to jump in as a wheelchair uh-huh. user. Um, I find eye contact overrated for a different reason because I am always lower down and always have to go like this to look up at people. So, you know, you'll have to excuse me if my no eye contact actually means that I'm staring directly into your crotch. It's really not me ignoring social norms here. It's just, uh, I think eye contact is quite ableist. Stop making me look up at you. Really? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm hearing a no on mind reading. Is that right? I like, I have to let that one go. I mean, <laughs> to intimidate somebody effectively but mm. for the x-men i don't really see it happening i'll tell you another interesting story about eye contact and line of sight and it, it makes me wish that our colleague day al muhammad was here um being low vision eye contact for me is sort of a, it's not as specific as you might think it is it's more of a directional orientation so i'm not i'm probably not actually staring anyone directly in the eyes and to the extent where especially if you're blind or low vision you learn very quickly to like sort of act like you're seeing what everyone else is seeing so if like someone gestures you know as happens to me at meetings all the time so as you can see in the presentation now i can't see the presentation <laughs> what's on the screen but i'll look over there like i can because you know, it's expected of me you know it's it's weird oh man yeah I do the time I, I'm always looking at the place between people's eyes and their nose and like they don't know they're like wow you make such good eye contact and I'm like thank you I'm a spy you know I again I, I really as an as non-autistic people um I think we're all coming clean with our deficits um and one of those deficits we really um people say that autistic folks um lack empathy, that's a lie, right? And you all know that. Uh, Autistic people are often more empathetic, but that's also a lie. It's really, uh, autistic folks have the baseline of empathy that you're supposed to have. (laughs) Neurotypical people like to feign empathy through something called eye contact, right? It's really just a big tool to once again, fake it um, so that we can make it through our days. Um, Because we, yeah. Yep. Some people make eye contact to cope. I didn't even think of that. Absolutely. He's a straight shooter. He, he <laughs> eye contact. He's got a firm handshake. I mean, let's also be real. Let's say that you've just worked an, you know, 20 plus hour day doing goodness knows whatever it is we do to make our paychecks. You go downstairs in your building to the local 7-Eleven. Do you really want to just sort of like be eye humping the counter guy? Or do you just want him to run your card so you can take your donuts and your Gatorade back up to your apartment in peace? You know, I think there's some, some reality there about what it is we should be doing. Yeah, I mean, that's a fair question, I think. Um, anything else on eye contact before yeah, we move on? I, I, I feel, yes, since this is a safe space to share, I do want to confess and, and Patrick saying eye humping really <laughs> is making me feel safe right now. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, you know, going back to the earlier question of coping with the severe deficit, and I, I, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm hearing everyone share and confess and it's like, you know, I always thought that my inability to say what I mean is from not trying hard enough. And I've been working on it um, over the years. And I thought maybe if I learned another language, I could communicate better in that language. You know, I grew up speaking Chinese and Spanish and I thought, well, if I could I can't say it in English. Maybe it's it's because I don't have a command of the English language and I could say it in another language and that will help me communicate better. And I it didn't really work out, but I think, you know, the eye contact, it's sort of this shortcut. It's like this loophole. Like if I can't say it with words, maybe I'll just, you know, shoot daggers and then they yeah, will know. To be it. Will know. <gasps> so I mean, I'm very confused about why you all are not talking about the ticker tape that we see going across people's foreheads. I thought that was a common neurotypical thing. Yeah. Except it's not the stock exchange. It's your innermost thoughts. Like, 
I'm sorry to be the one to break it to everyone. <laughs> I've just been holding that in, but I think we need to talk about it. That's our secret. Oh man, I knew there You're not was supposed something. To tell. I sorry. knew there was something. I, just, I lost my neurotypical card just now. Oh Worth goodness, it. that someone is gonna like come in and take you away. You've revealed too much. You're not supposed to say that, Emily. I know, I know. I'm sorry, but you said Elena said this with a safe space. All right, I I (laughs) need to just quickly say um, for our um, the people who are joining us on Zoom, um, many of whom are autistic people and um, taking things literally as we often do. Emily is lying. There isn't really ticker tape, but it was really funny though. Thank you for clarifying. (laughs) Yes, I say it all in jest. It was really funny. All right. Um, I'm going to move on. This is another um, social media uh, question that we got from an autistic follower um, who wants to know, why are there so many social rules? Why are they secret? And how did you learn them since they are secret? You know, okay. So funny thing about social rules in general, um, some of them, it does seem like they're, they're unspoken rules. Now, what's fun though, is that there's also sort of places that you can go or be a part of that will also take every social rule and in essence, beat it into you. Now, some of them are, are also unspoken. So we've talked often, I am Southern. I'm from South Carolina and I participated in a very Southern tradition called the Botillion, which is a, a coming out for young eligible young men, uh, an introduction to society, if you will. And there's also cotillions, which are for young ladies to be introduced into society. And a lot of those included this conversation about proper social rules and mores. Now, the the thing is, that's interesting is that there was just as many unspoken rules in that space as there were spoken rules, but that was one of the places that was in dot where you were indoctrinated in that way. And what was even funnier was that after I left South Carolina and came to DC, I took uh, Chinese martial arts. And there was a whole other set of rules inside that system beyond just, you know, learning how to be an effective fighter. But like, that was also about like social space management um, and how you sit and where you sit in spaces, depending on hierarchy. Um, so it, it is weird. Um, but, you know, there are places that have the rules written down, but, you know, people, people don't always want to read them. Now, if anyone wants to sit and have a conversation about the proper etiquette for continental meal eating or how you should escort a lady from one point to another, you know, you, you guys let me know. <laughs> wow. No, that's really valuable. Yeah, because I know that there are these things like etiquette classes, and I've always thought that that was kind of the 201, and no one will give you a class on the 101. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is interesting to know about and think about. Any other thoughts on social rules? Yeah, I mean, one thing I'll say is that I think people are getting confused about them all the time. So I'm a big reader and listener of advice columns and, and podcasts, um, and they're just full constantly of people who are who have different interpretations of the social rules and need to go to an advice columnist to help them sort it out. Um, uh, yeah, but I mean, I think that also social rules are their, their scripts to help us get through the day. Um, just because, you know, as non-autistic people, um, we since we are impaired, like we were saying earlier in our ability to just be direct about what we mean and just communicate using words with the people we encounter, we have to rely on these, these kind of uh, non-verbal rules to help us navigate social situations. And so it's really, you know, like we were talking earlier, it's a coping, coping mechanism. Absolutely. And, and, you know, again, Zoe, in, in seriousness, though, it is interesting. You could argue that some of the cultural issues that we're having right now um, are tied to the fact that there are there were sort of longstanding rules or engagements that weren't healthy for everyone. Um, and now we're trying to recreate better rules that are more inclusive. Then on the other hand, you have things like, let's say, cell phone usage where it's like, we're still trying to figure out what the social mores are there um, and how that should be applied. And I think it's interesting too, when you have like a strong neurodiversity community that, you know, in many ways 
also can sort of call BS on the fact that it's like, you don't even know what this rule is here for. Why isn't it appropriate for me to do X or for you to do X, you know? And like, that's, that's real too. I also think Absolutely. that uh, neurotypicals are having some serious um, COVID related problems right now with mask mm -hmm. wearing. Um, apparently we can't have a conversation without being able to see a person's full face to the point where I have run into a couple of people if I have to unfortunately leave my house to go grocery shopping and someone I knew took his mask off to be like, it's me. And I was like, you know, put that thing back on. I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm a little too neurotypical sometimes, but like, I think I could have figured out it was you. You really didn't need to take the mask off for that. I like to pretend that I'm doing a Cobra related cosplay. That's a GI Joe related <laughs> in case you guys are wondering. Uh, this is Maria. I, I want to say to Allegra's point, if folks want um, evidence of how often non-autistic people struggle with social rules, I highly recommend looking at the Reddit uh, column or collection called Am I the Asshole? And apologies if that, if that language is harsh for anyone, but that's actually what it is called. And it's literally people, we don't know if they're autistic or non-autistic, but let's assume that the majority of them are non-autistic. Having to ask strangers, am I the asshole in this situation? And the answer more often than not is yes. That's true. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of rules, but they don't cover everything. Um. Oh, so something that I think we've been touching on a little bit when we've been talking about scripting. Um, as we all know, autistic people love to use scripts to deal with complicated social situations like ordering coffee or asking someone what their name is. Um, but is it true that non-autistic people go through life without using scripts? And if so, how do you find inner peace and tranquility when your whole life is a chaotic and unpredictable roller coaster ride of interacting with people on the fly? I'll go first. I think we've already uh, discussed part of the issue that as a non-autistic person, I actually use scripts all the time um, because it's the only way I can make it through my day. I, the, the chaos of having to speak unprepared at anything um, in fact, all of this is an illusion, actually. I've just done this so many times now that I have it pretty much, you know, as a standard so that I can pontificate ad nauseum. It's sort of like the script has become the non-script. Mm. Mm. Yes, because I know people are constantly asking you what it's like not to be autistic. I, this is Emily. Oh, Emily, you're muted. Oh, I just realized that. Um, <laughs> this is Emily. I'll I'll say, um, you know, I, I think it, it's all really a lie that we don't use scripting. I think that it's more so that we hide it. Well, you know, that we're expected mm -hmm. to hide it. So there's some kind of rule that, you know, we're just supposed to know what we're saying on the fly. But don't think for a second that I'm not looking in the mirror and having those hard conversations <laughs> with myself before I have them with somebody else. But the thing is that, you know, heaven forbid a neurotypical person say that we did something like scripting out in the big, wild, scary world beyond this saves me is then we may be terribly judged for needing to prepare our thoughts, a tragedy. Oh, that's so, yeah, they do often say that neurotypical culture can be really cutthroat. So thank you for being so vulnerable to share yeah. that with us. Add to that too, if I may, I, um, I've never admitted this before, but I also use scripts and it's not just one script. I have endless scripts. I mean, I have like Excel spreadsheets full of scripts for every single scenario possible. And so, yeah, I think maybe one of the misconceptions is that there's just a single script, but it's really multiple scripts for every possible scenario where we may be misunderstood or not able to communicate. Yeah, absolutely. So, we're finding so many commonalities here that I yes. hadn't expected. 
Yeah, Elena, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I feel like this is such a good example of all the misconceptions out there about us as non-autistic people. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. this chance for us to yeah. correct those misconceptions. To it spread feels good. about who we are. Now, I, I will admit this may be weird, but personally, I thrive in chaos, um, which may be a neurotypical thing. Like I, I might, um, I'm realizing this right now in this moment, it's just so much, but I do, um, I am more at peace in chaos than I am like in peaceful environments, much to the chagrin of my autistic partner. Wow. Oh. Yeah, that's, that is really interesting. I feel like we're, um, you know, like I said, neurotypical people, unlike you might think, are not a monolith. You know, if you've met one non-autistic person, you've met one non-autistic person. Um, and I think we're really seeing that reinforced that um, there are so, some of this I can relate to even as an autistic person. And then some of this, wow, you know, challenging to think about thriving in chaotic conditions. But you have to, you know, you have to learn about that to, to be able to, you know, get to understanding and acceptance. I feel like I want to thank everybody for their bravery. This is yeah, really of course. hard to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely. No, this has been wonderful. This is a wonderful space. Thank you all for doing this with me. Um, want to, does anyone else want to talk about um, scripting before we move on to the next question? Well, I'll just say that what we were discussing earlier around how are you is a perfect example of how Absolutely. many non-autistic people script all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the scripts might not be what I would call the most logical of scripts, but they do, you know, they work for you. So maybe I can learn to find value in them for that. Yeah. I mean, I think that I would say for me as a non-autistic person, sometimes I do very purposeful scripting, like writing out notes before a conversation, but to get through my day to day, it's scripts that I'm not even using very consciously uh, because I've just memorized them so well. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's probably true for some other people too. And that's how we end up sometimes not always actually making sense because we're just not being as absolutely absolutely all right another question that we got um and this really resonates with me as someone that has worked in a few different offices at this point what is the purpose of workplace politics assuming that a group of people have been hired to work together to achieve a goal why would they then do anything other than work together to achieve their goal why do workplace politics happen and how do you deal with them would love any insight you guys might have. I would be happy to share some insight as somebody who works from home most of the time. And this was pre COVID um, I've worked remotely quite a bit. And so I don't have social cues to bounce off of uh, when I'm looking to understand exactly what's going on. So my office politics happen via email and then I have absolutely no sense of anyone's tone and it is really confusing. It is incredibly confusing to try to understand exactly what someone is conveying to you via email. And, you know, as a non-autistic person, I probably spend a good solid at least 30 minutes of every day wasting time reading an email again because not because I'm trying to understand what they said but because I'm trying to find the subtext and determine how much they hate me in any given moment mm. but you might have to because they might also not be autistic yes I mean when I'm when I'm communicating with other non-autistic people you know again we all don't say what we mean so when someone sends me okay that's great exclamation point I will then have to spend about a half an hour deciding what the meaning of that exclamation point was and how much trouble I'm going to be in the next day oh my goodness yeah that's that's really intense thank you for sharing that this is Maria so while people might be hired to work together to achieve a goal, um, each person may have a different understanding of what that goal is or means. Also, in addition to bringing their skills and expertise to a workplace, people also bring personal agendas and may tie those agendas to how work gets accomplished. And so when you're in the, in the office or on email trying to, to do the work, um, I often find myself having to navigate other people's personal agendas and ask like, why are they recommending this specific thing or topic? Is it because 
they actually want to use this as an opportunity to get ahead. Do I want them to get ahead? I don't know. Um, but but all of those things can go into doing the work, even though they're not related to the overall goal you're all working toward. Indeed. Yeah. And actually, Maria made me think of a, something else that, that I hadn't thought about in a while, too, which is is definitely worth worth mentioning, which is that office politics can also be tied to separate leadership styles as well. Um, so you may have a uh, set of goals that you are supposed to accomplish. Um, however, your leadership may have certain beliefs about what creates efficiency or what creates um, creates an opportunity to, um, to, to be creative or what makes basically their team do their best. So you may have one leader that really believes that everyone being on the same page and constantly connecting with each other is important and makes the work go better. You may have another team lead that believes that contention amongst their team is what makes them more efficient. And, and so you have to sort of look out for that because those things can then lead to that office politics sort of space. And you have to also think about what works best for you. Yeah, that's a really great breakdown of it. Um, Allegra or Elena, is there anything that you want to add on office politics before I move on? The way I see it is, is in light of my background. My background's in theater and it's just sort of this space to act out different scenarios. Um, for some of us, you know, we don't really know what our politics are like we're just hearing bits and pieces from the news and there's sound bites here and talking points here and it's just a place to toss it out and see what happens um so I feel like sometimes I've worked in places where no one's you know I question whether they really believe what they are saying um and it's 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 sort of this space to uh say something and then see what happens I think yeah. yeah, that's such an interesting yeah. point. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that also so much of it is that so many of us as non-autistic people um, are very relationship driven. Um, and uh, so even if ostensibly we're in the workplace to achieve a particular work goal, um, well, I, I should really use I statements. I know that I'm constantly thinking about um, my relationships with the other people in that workplace. Does this person like me? Like, do they want to be friends with me? Is that person mad at me? You know, like Emily was saying, like constantly trying to figure out, is that person mad at me? Yeah. Both because if they are, it'll get in the way of my ability to actually get the work done um, and because I care about what they think of me um, and I can't yeah. turn off the part of my brain that's always thinking about what do these people think of me? Do they like me? Do I like them? Um, are we going to be friends? Do they think that I'm doing a good job? And yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, that's just another deficit that uh, that I have as a non-autistic person yeah. like, that that takes up such a big part of my brain all the time. But it's not like yeah. we can ask those questions directly. So we have to engage mm. in this office politics and ask it in 800 different ways. Yes. Rather, you know, I, I yeah. So I it's ask those it's, questions. It's genuine. It's genuinely tiring. I mean, yeah. I can't tell you how many emails I've rewritten because I've, I'm using too many exclamation points, but I want to seem cheerful. Um, but I want to ask respectfully, but I don't want it to come. <laughs> cold it's it's bananas yeah the emojis sometimes do, help <laughs> do autistic people not have to rewrite emails constantly just to get the tone exactly right and worry for half an hour or an hour about how the other person will feel upon reading the email is that a non-autistic thing me, yeah I, th I mean, I think there's a way that we kind of have to play into it because for some reason, a lot of the people I end up emailing are non-autistic people. And, I, you know, I don't want to, um, I want so to sure feel welcome when they're talking to me. It is hard. I, mean, I really like, appreciate yeah. your efforts, though. We have someone who emails with oh, you. Oh, thank you. Makes yeah, of course. Good. I mean, you know, so I want to, knowing non-autistic people how I do, knowing that like um, an exclamation point can, can really send someone into a spiral, I want to be careful and judicial in my usage, mm -hmm. um, you know, and make sure that my email sounds welcoming. But it is really tempting to just like start the email, put in all the information that needs to be conveyed, end the email and send it. <laughs> and I sometimes do. <laughs> But see, that's you accommodating neurotypical people, right? It is. Well, that's there. a lot of my life. 
yeah i mean really it's a little ridiculous the time that we waste on determining meanings is probably similar to the time that you waste on making sure that you've sent an email that leaves no room for confusion so i mean truly i'm sorry that you have to it must be a real burden to accommodate neurotypical people sometimes Oh, thank you. You know, I'm trying to reframe it and think of it as work that I'm putting in to be part of a diverse community, Um, you know, because it's okay to have needs and it's okay to have needs that relate to exclamation marks and emails, Um, you know, so I want to make sure I put in that work to make sure all my friends and coworkers feel welcome and feel accepted when we're communicating. Um, But I have thought sometimes, would it be okay if I just wrote parentheses, this exclamation mark doesn't mean I hate you, um, and left it at that, um, rather than trying to figure out how to, like, cue that with the other words surrounding the exclamation mark. Um, I have never quite tried it, but it's been on my mind often, that kind of thing. And uh, this is Maria. So workplace politics can really uh, be a doozy for disabled people, even non-autistic disabled people, because things like tangible physical things get very political. So when a disabled person requests an accommodation and gets, let's say a new chair, other employees say things like, well, why did Maria get a new chair? Why, you know, this, I'm gonna go, uh, I need a new chair too. And you're like, I just wanted an accommodation. Um, And that is a reflection of the fact that all workplaces need to be better and treat all employees well. (laughs) And if we just um, created work cultures that really respected everyone um, and encouraged everyone to thrive and not think from a place of scarcity, we would all be doing much better and probably be much more productive. Yeah, that's really interesting because in the autism space, we often say like, um, we know much more about what autism looks like when people are in an environment that doesn't work for them versus when people are in an environment that does work for them. Um, You know, because to find an environment that's really accommodating of autistic people is pretty rare. Um, But I'm wondering, is that true of being neurotypical as well? Like some of the things that we might think of as hallmarks of neurotypical culture, like office politics, do they really come out of deprivation and out of people not having an environment that works for them? So that's really interesting to think of. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I wonder, you know, at, if, if uh, non-autistic yeah, people had more adequate social skills training in how to do things like communicate openly about how we feel about each other and about the work that we're doing, maybe that would help. I've wondered about that. There is, yeah, I feel like a lot of social skills training, you know, that autistic people get, um, only goes so far because some of it is very abusive first of all but even if it's just like people laying out the rules there isn't that component part where neurotypical people get told how to interact with us or skills that they might find useful even when no autistic people are around like how to say I would like to eat dinner at a different place if that's what you would like for example um so I yeah I think that could be really useful well Um, I mean it's I was it's happens in in pockets right too Zoe I mean basically what we're talking is almost the 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 exact premise of the IT crowd, which if you guys haven't seen, is a British show about these guys who work in the IT department. Actually, no, it's not about the guys who work in the IT department. It's about the young lady who has to manage the guys who work in the IT department and how she's supposed to basically translate between them and the executive like body and how weird it all gets. Uh, so I it's, bet, yeah, yeah, that we don't quite know what it's like in successful spaces because we always relegate it to being the other um maybe we should do better with that yeah i think i think we could do better for non-autistic people and for autistic people um one more question uh before we start looking if it's okay with you guys with some questions that our audience on zoom is sending in um what is networking networking we've heard a lot about it why is it important and how might you do it This is Emily. I will say that networking really goes back to a series of uh, what we were talking about before with scripting, right? It's all about the small talk 
you know, I think as a, as a non-autistic person, you know, you can't just say, I would not like to engage in small talk today because then somehow you are considered incredibly rude. And instead you do in fact have to have the same conversation with people about the weather 25 times. This is also amplified at conferences. I mean, really, you know, being non-autistic at conferences is, it's a terrible thing because we're all just expected to have these conversations. And, you know, I personally think that it is some serious autistic privilege that you all get to have your color badges that say whether you would like to talk to someone or not, Um, you know, and I'm just going to stand up right now for that, for that privilege that you have. No, I say this all in jest, um, truly, but yeah, there, there's absolutely this expectation when you are at big events that um, you are required to have conversations with people even if you too are not in the mood to have a conversation. There's arguably even an, an encouragement that if you don't have them, then somehow you've stepped outside of a, a social norm. Even if you're at a conference where you don't know anyone, like you are expected to go and like be the life of the party. It, it certainly does feel, in all seriousness, it does often feel like a series of personal interactions that you're running like a scorecard almost. Like there's plenty of times where networking is important. You're in a space, you need to meet people to fulfill a workplace mission. And then sometimes it's like, I gotta go through a cycle of the room at least twice so that my name is out there. And like, you know, I can say that I talk to everyone. And it's like, dude, that's, that bit isn't fun. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead, this is Elena, I'm going to go ahead and say that it is fun for me. Um, It is wildly uncomfortable to do networking, but it's a place to be uncomfortable with other uncomfortable people. So there's this like shared experience that we all have and just being really this chaos and and unpredictableness of this event. so I don't know. I think I enjoy it for that reason. Just being uncomfortable with other uncomfortable people. You just power through it. <laughs> that is so interesting. I had thought that networking was like an innate neurotypical trait or skill, but it's sounding like um, it would be great if you guys could opt out of it, in fact. Um, I think it depends. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but I, I, was, I like I like the idea of being uncomfortable with other uncomfortable people. I feel like that's a good way to look at it. This is Maria. I actually look at it pretty differently. Um, but again, I'm the non-autistic person that thrives in chaos. So um, I, I, I like networking. And typically when you're in a situation where networking is expected, um, like a conference or a meeting or something, um, everyone is there. Uh, with something in common. Maybe you're interested in um, similar topics or you do similar kinds of work. Um, And so for me, I go into it with the assumption that I will have something um, to relate to with everyone. And I think it goes back to what Allegra was saying um, that us non-autistic people are just super um, re- relationship driven. And so really networking is just us asserting our preferences around over everyone. Um, when we talk about, it's not what you know, it's who you know, it's just, again, like um, some serious <clears throat> non-autistic people trying to take over the world. Um, I'm revealing all kinds of secret plans, but um, I, I do, uh, I think networking can can bring people together but it's also really helpful to go in with some some tricks. Um, So for example, Mm -hmm. I always stand by the food or the bar because it means that people will have to come to me. I do not have to approach Mm -hmm. people. It's also good to have a networking buddy, um, perhaps who knows um, more people than you do in a a particular environment, because again, it means people will come to you and you don't have to go to them and there's even somebody to help break the ice. So networking um, definitely has its drawbacks, but there are ways to, to manage that. And I feel like that information needs to be shared. 
Yeah, I completely agree with with Maria. Um, I enjoy networking in many senses. Uh, like, like Maria said, it's about finding people who I might have something in common with or might be able to do something with later on. Um, but yeah, the context in which it often happens of crowded no, crowded rooms with many conversation hap ha happening is not very accessible for me and is very exhausting for me. Um, so it's that back and forth that often I can only handle it for a little bit at a time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what it comes down to is like Maria was basically saying, relationships are power. Um, and I don't even mean that in a bad way. If power is the ability to get things done, to achieve the things that you care about and make things happen in the world, um, then knowing more people um, and having access to more information about what's going on and who's doing what is a way of getting that power um, so that you can achieve your goals, which might be like great goals, like disability rights wins. Um, and so when I look at networking, it's both like it can be a fun social experience, even though it's also sometimes overwhelming um, sensorily, um, but like it's fun to get to know people who are interested in the same things. And it's a way of achieving those goals over time. This is Emily. Wow. I would also love to add um, a, a really great uh, life hack that I have for networking is letting other people do the talking whenever possible. Um, there's a quote, and I really hope I'm not misattributing it. I think it's Maya Angelou who said that people will forget what you said, but they won't forget how you made them feel. And if I did misattribute that, I sincerely apologize. Um, but I think that is absolutely the truth. I am more than happy to listen to people talk about themselves. Uh, and, you know, that makes them feel like they are important and like I am centering them. And then in turn, I think that makes for successful networking. But there's also uh, one thing I think we haven't talked about, which is forced networking, like um, speed, speed dating type networking and things like that. Um, whereas, you know, I, I bow to Maria for thriving in chaos. I must say that I am the complete opposite in that sense. And when you put me in a forced networking situation, um, my ability to use all of my, my life hacks suddenly goes out the window because I feel like I have five minutes to impress someone and I better, I better do my absolute best because if I don't, then I've somehow proven myself to be rather mediocre. And so really, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of stressing out about what other people think about you at all times. It all goes back to that for me is what do other people think of me in terms of how I am presenting myself at any given moment? I find that yeah. scripting really helps with networking, like we were talking about earlier, like just having a standard spiel about what it is that I do that someone else might potentially find interesting. I don't know if that's a technique that the rest of you use. Oh, oh, I'm a, I'm a fan of the elevator speech. I have several. <laughs> yeah. And this is Maria, you know, this is also like one of the reasons I wear bold lipstick is because if people can find nothing else to talk to me about, they will often talk to me about my lipstick. And so you can develop, I, I believe in non-autistic spaces, we call them trademarks, right? Like. Uh, whether it's clothing or jewelry or, or something, right? And it's really um, helping manage all of these social situations where um, you don't, you're not forced to come up with a script off the top of your head. It's just for me sitting right there on my lips. That's true. Yeah, no, for me, that's my headphones. So um, I'm, whenever I'm in a, a situation where there's a lot of people around, I'm wearing my headphones. I wear them most of the day. Um, and they're something that I'm known for. They're kind of like my swag. Um, and people will ask me about them. And then I get to be like, they're great. You should try them. You should wear headphones. Headphones are wonderful. Um, so that is something that even as an autistic person, I'm able to adapt that and use it. I find that really valuable. Um, I had realized Zoe. that your lipstick was the same thing. Uh, yeah, heck yeah, headphones. They're just the best. Um, so um, we have about half an hour left. Um, how would you guys feel about taking some questions from the audience? All right, now these are questions that you won't have been able to prepare for in advance, but I understand that as non-autistic people, you thrive on that sort of thing. So I'm just gonna throw some stuff at you, see how it goes. Um, first question, um, this is a really great one. As non-autistic people, are you aware of where your muscles are and how to use them at all times? 
This is Emily, and that is a hard no for me on account of the fact that I am physically disabled. And so my muscles don't, we don't get along. We're in a constant fight. Some of them don't even work. They're just, they're functionally useless. My muscles are low functioning. There, I said it. Yeah, let, let, me, let me tell you something <laughs> interesting from my martial arts background <laughs> training. Most people don't know where their muscles are or even how to use any of them. We are fortunate we can walk around as effectively as we possibly can. And obviously for our friends with mobility disabilities, that's out the window still. But yeah, no, nobody knows. Nobody knows unless you've specifically like decided to make yourself aware of those individual muscle groups and spaces. And the fun thing is, you know, obviously you can forget, you stop using them for a little while and they languish just like anything else. So, you know, it's, it's the real life. Man. Fascinating, absolutely. <laughs> so this is Maria. I, I, I have the reverse problem of Emily because my disability gives me spastic muscles all the time. I do know where all of my muscles are. Um, and, uh, and I do actually know how to use them, um, but they refuse to be used that way. So um, even though Emily and I have very different like experiences of this, my muscles and I are often in, in a fight, um, and, but they, they definitely make themselves known to me on a very regular basis. That is good to know. Um, Oh, here's one that I'm really enjoying because I was on a panel last week where someone unexpectedly asked me a question about dating that I thought wasn't the most appropriate to ask in that context. So now I'm going to do it to someone else. Why is it that non-autistic people always get drinks when going out on a date? Why not go to a bookstore? I'm a little disappointed that I'm suddenly realizing that I'm the only uh, male here. <laughs> I'm going to punt on that. I think that's true. So this is Maria. I have a system. Um, and I think one of the reasons that non-autistic people get drinks is because um, with getting drinks, um, and it can be getting coffee, getting beverages, uh, it's not a long time commitment. And so if you wind up not liking the person or not oh. into them, you haven't committed to a full meal or a full activity and you have an easy way out. Once the drink is done, you can just say goodbye and there's no further obligation to spend any time. It's not great to start out with an open-ended activity because then you lose out on those clear cues. Oh, that's such a good point. I love it because, you know, just like I said, non-autistic people aren't a monolith and they don't all get along with each other. Um, so, you know, no one can go on a date and anticipate that they'll definitely hit it off and everyone needs an out. Yeah, that's such a great point. This is Emily. Any other thoughts on? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say that I have learned the hard way um, that I needed to set myself an out because I would do dinners with people and then, um, get about a quarter of the way through them and realize that it just wasn't working out and I had run out of things to say. And as a non-autistic person, I am not very good with silence. So I need to fill it and I needed to be filled and I cannot just sit in my, my peace and my quiet and enjoy someone's presence if I don't know them very well. Um, although I will say that there was one particular instance where I was on a date at a restaurant where they had really good rainbow cookie cake. And I spent a long time trying to decide if it was worth sticking it out on the date long enough to get dessert, even though it was one of the worst dates I had ever been on, but I really wanted the cake. I, I got the cake, but I mean, truly, don't don't put yourself in a situation where you're choosing between eating cake and staying on a date. It's terrible. I don't recommend it. Oh, that sounds so tough. Yeah, absolutely. I love cake. That would be a real problem for me. Um, Kara on the chat says, um, as a non-autistic person with a lot of anxiety, coffee or drinks is likely to have a set end time so I can gracefully make my exit and go home. Yeah, that makes sense to me as well. 
I'm, I'm learning so many relatable things about non-autistic people. Um, any other thoughts on date venues before I move on to the next question? All right. Um, here's a good one for all of us that we're gathered together on Zoom. Um, do you have to look at the Zoom window to see what expression other people are making and purposely make the same expression show up on your face? Um, I'm always looking at myself on Zoom to try and figure out what expression my face is making so I can determine whether it's appropriate. Um, sometimes the mood of a meeting will quickly change and then I'll have to change my expression. <laughs> if I'm not seeing myself, I forget to do that. Um, but I know that um, our neurotypical people, what I don't know, do you think about facial expressions a lot or is it just automatic? But anyway, has Zoom changed that for you? Um, the the sort of primacy of facial expressions in your life. Um, how has how has Zoom meetings affected that? This is Emily, and I want to say really quickly that I have been told, um, and please forgive my cursing, that I have a terrible case of resting bitch face. Um, so I often, and in fact, almost always look very disinterested in what people are saying. And so I've taken to, and I don't have it right now, but I made a zoom background for myself. And at the top, it just says, I'm not angry. This is my face. So that, that That's spells okay. it out for people. And I, I really do. I use it during work meetings because, you know, since, uh, non-autistic people rely so heavily on other people's facial cues. I have to adapt and accommodate them at all times and can't in fact live my best life looking like a bitch all the time. So you could, if you decide to cheat as many men do like now think about this. Now we live in a society that has all sorts of established facial expressions, but also behaviors for meeting. Let me give you guys a couple of good ones for those who you can see. First, the pensive look. Note how my hand is covering most of my face and you can not tell anything that I'm, uh, that I'm thinking. Oh, oh, he looks really engaged, ooh. And if you wanna switch it up, you can go the other side. You can also go with this one or this one, but the point is you're covering your face because I do the exact same thing. I, I look at my image in the camera and saying, am I making the appropriate face? Do I look engaged? The worst is when I don't look engaged. So I'm like, oh, I got to do some stuff to look engaged. Like I am totally interested in this mundanity that my coworker is uh, cranking out for me right now. So yeah, it's, a, it's another one of those neurotypical games that we're forced to play rather than focus on doing our actual work. Yeah, that's tough. I'm going to steal that. Um, this is just how my face looks idea. I think that's pretty great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wasn't. I mean, this is a neat one too. Yeah. I could do this. I don't know if you can hear me like this. I might have to uncover my actually, mouth. Actually, guys, actually, emulate. actually, Zoe, you know what? I'm not going to totally blow this spot up. But I used to work next to this team of very adept uh, young women. And I could tell what mood they were in by the accessories that they wore. They liked scarves. And I happen to know that if they were having a particularly chilly day with each other, they would all be wearing scarves. And I'm pretty sure they were using them to cover up their faces. Uh, oh. Right. I won't say where I was working or whom I was working with. They were all very, very professional women. I'm chuckling because this was my team. <laughs> 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 That's incredible. Maria, do you want to explain the scarf code further? No, there wasn't actually a scarf code at all. It was just Patrick trying to um, trying to have a way to understand what our mood was. So I think mm. he imbued the scarves with, with meaning. When really, um, I will say my scarf wearing, um, you know, I, I'm Southern as well. So did not really understand um, the significance of scarves until I moved to DC where it is cold and then realized like the world had opened up to a whole new accessory for me that I could enjoy. Um, and so I think all of us were just taking style cues from one another. Um. 
Well, that's such a good uh, example of what we we're talking about before about how we do not all agree on the social rules and we're all looking for content about other people's feelings all the time because we can't right. just talk about it. Nope. <laughs> and yeah, I do no, stare that's really like interesting. facial expressions on Zoom a lot. Um, I do too. But I, yeah, and I, I don't know because before I functioned okay in meetings without being able to see my face, not always without thinking about my expressions, I did, but now that it's there, I'm just very focused on it. All right, um, here's a question that I think is really interesting. One of our um, attendees on Zoom asks, I'm a creative writer. How do I write a realistic, non-autistic person? Please give me Chris, uh, please give me tips so that I can avoid criticism from non-autistic people if I get it wrong. This is Elena. And I would say, you know, as we're learning from this conversation, we have mentioned a few times, there's a lot of commonalities here, right? We're more similar than we are different. So my advice would be, you know, write about an autistic person and remove all clarity and directness. And there is your non-autistic person character. Huh. So Elaine, hold on, this is bad. <laughs> you, you pretty much almost just quoted uh, the movie I was thinking of. There's a movie, there's a movie called uh, As Good As It Gets stars Jack Nicholson, and he is a romance novels and bodice rippers, and he runs oh. and she, says, she says, how do you write so well for women? Um, and of course, he says something terrible to her, which she then says, is, I think of a man, and I take away reason and accountability. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of, oh, no. it's sort of hilarious. It's like, yeah, you could probably, you could probably apply that there are typical people if you want to. It's like take an autistic person, take away reason and accountability. There you go. You're done. <laughs> I have to say, accountability is not the first thing that comes to mind when I think of men. But maybe <laughs> that's just me. Oh yeah. Oh not just you. <laughs> that movie has great minds. <laughs> oh yeah. This no, is Emily, and I would just like to way. volunteer my services as a non-autistic sensitivity reader. I don't oh, know fantastic. why we don't employ more non-autistic sensitivity readers. It's very offensive. I agree. I say, I say again in jest. <laughs> this is fantastic. All right. Um, oh, and we have Kara in the chat volunteering her services as a non-autistic sensitivity reader as well. That's wonderful. So um, for our writer uh, attendee, I hope um, you now have lots of non-autistic people you could contact about this. Um, any other tips about writing um, like a, a true and authentic non-autistic character in fiction? This is Maria. A lot of your dialogue will be small talk. Like if you can't think of what to write, just stick in like Google small talk and just stick in some examples. You'll be good. So it'll be like, I walked in the room and there was Stacy. The weather has been bad, Stacy said. And yeah, to keep that going for a couple of pages. Yeah. All right, all right, I can see this, okay. Um, oh, Patrick, someone wants to know whether Baby Yoda is autistic or not autistic. Ooh, well, you know, I, I think what's been the most interesting about Baby Yoda has been the multiple communities that have claimed Baby Yoda as their own. Um, now, you know, I, I, I'm not really willing to place any labels on Baby Yoda, I, I, not by gender, not I want to be speciest in any way that I possibly can. But if you want to, if you see yourself in Baby Yoda, then I think Baby Yoda can be neurodiverse as much as you need him to be. I mean, arguably, when you're born being able to use the force, that kind of feels like you're in the right space anyway, but you know. Go, go with it. <laughs> yeah, I haven't actually seen The Mandalorian, so I don't have tons of thoughts on Baby Yoda. I know that Baby Yoda doesn't talk, but I don't know if a Yoda normally talks at Baby Yoda's age. So I'm not sure whether we know that or not. Um, that would help us determine whether Baby Yoda is autistic, I think. That's the, that's the fun thing, though, isn't it? Because we don't know. Um, and he's supposed to be 50 by this point that we meet him in the first episode of the Mandalorian. 
Um, I'm sorry, we meet them. I'm getting corrected on my pronouns by uh, my mm-hmm. off-screen associates. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's kind of cool. But then again, like I said, I think that's why it's awesome to be able to take a character like Baby Yoda and to be able to say, I see myself in them, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I've seen some beautiful, um, like, uh, Native American beadwork pieces that have Baby Yoda on them. Um, those were going around the internet earlier. I love those. Um, not related to anything about whether Baby Yoda is autistic. I just remembered it in the middle of this. Um, oh, here's a good one. Do you have special interests as a non-autistic person? And if you don't have them, how do you find purpose or meaning in your life? You know, I'm going to tell you a secret about neurotypical people, which is that many of them actually have a compartmentalized bit of autism like inside of them that they use to obsess over certain things. I mean, I'm a, I'll turn my camera so you guys can see. I might be neurotypical, but those are all of our comic books and sci-fi nerdcore stuff. And that is well beyond, I think, what would you consider as a a neurotypical person shouldn't really have that much nerdcore stuff. That's our autistic obsession. And I, if you want to go ad nauseum about any of those particular things, that's how I do it. It's a special superpower. I unlock when I need to. I channel my inner autism and talk ad nauseum about comics and disability. I'm so relieved that you're not living without a special interest. That sounded very scary to me. Um, anyone else want to weigh in on this? This is Maria. I do think for non-disabled people, um, they often view disability as a special interest and are like, you know, wow, you really talk about that a lot. Um, and perhaps think that us disability advocates are kind of odd and we're like, this is this is not a this is not a special interest, it's a human interest. Uh it is uh it's our lives. Uh but good for you uh for thinking that. So just noting. I think this is also a case where for me as a non-autistic person, I may not know what I'm missing. I mean, I have things I'm interested in that I care about a lot and think and talk about a lot, but are they special interests or is there just this, this whole other plane that I'm just not able to access? I don't know. Now, is it okay for a non-autistic person to enjoy things like trains and, you know, dinosaurs. I mean, is, is this allowed? I just, I feel like I, I don't want to impinge on autistic people here. You know, I, I feel perhaps that I need to defer and ask permission. Oh, no, I mean, I think it's, it's great that you want to check. But yes, of course, I think trains are, and dinosaurs are for everyone. I um, just, I'm not trying to culturally appropriate here. For sure, for sure. Yeah, no, but that would be cool to share, <laughs> share trains and dinosaurs with people, um, both of which are common special interests for autistic people, which is why um, yes. Emily brings that up. Um, but no, I think um, especially trains, the more people are interested in trains, the better, because we don't have enough trains in the United States and could use more. <gasps> Dinosaurs that's cool. Oh, that's so cute. I thought they were holding. I just wanted to make sure I asked permission awesome. before I showed off my, my love of dinosaurs. That is fantastic. You know, I'm so glad you said that because when I talk to my non autistic friends and when we share about this, um, I think there's a long way to go for a lot of us still in self acceptance and learning to deal with this internalized, you know, I don't, I don't want to call it hatred because it's a really strong word, but we, we have a long way to go in that. And so a lot of us mask it, you know, we might have special interests, but we call them hobbies, right? Oh. And so it, it's, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about, again, in the theme of commonalities, um, you know, we might not call it special interest, we might call it something else, but it's, it's there. You, you know, and again, though, in, in seriousness, there is also an interesting sort of cultural thing that goes on here. Like I, I found it, I remember when we went over to the UK, um, 
to well to to see David Tennant because we're Whovians and love Doctor Who, um, that it seemed like it was sort of accepted for especially for like dudes there to have like this one thing that they were interested in like significantly and and in Japan I noticed the same thing too where it was like it was okay to have like this one thing that you were super obsessed over and it's weird in the states there's almost like this embarrassment if you know too much about this one thing that isn't like work or or uh sports and I mean, even even in the government spaces, like there was sort of this space for these guys who were like super obsessed with the process. Um, and it was looked at, you know, it's like, oh, that's sort of odd. So it's it's always a little weird to me, actually, like especially in the States that there's this belief that if you're if you're in this, if you're really into something that somehow you're not supposed to care that much about like one thing that's not I don't know, like normal mundanity it's it's weird i don't i don't quite understand it this is maria but patrick to tease out something you just said and to build on elena's point um there are lots of things that uh that are actually special interests for non-autistic people but we actually think that everyone should be obsessed with them so we don't think of mm -hmm. them as special interests and if, if you want a, a really good example professional sports Right, like, I, I I really um, am not a, a, you know hugely into sports, but when I go home to my family who are huge SEC fans, I make sure to look up how the Louisiana State University Tigers are doing that season to make sure I have something to talk about. Um, right, have to be aware and pretend that you're knowledgeable. Yeah, I do that exactly. People, now, yeah. do I do I ask them why are you so interested in football? Like this is a real special interest. Is that okay? I don't ask them that. Um, but I mean, <laughs> that's really what I think. <laughs> that's a good point. And Laura in the chat points out that many people also cosplay professional sports, um, like wearing jerseys of their favorite players or things yeah. like that. Can uh, I which I believe is also not considered. Yeah, go my ahead. My boyfriend, okay. My boyfriend um, has told me this story a couple of times. He says, you know, he was on a train and there were a bunch of people going to a baseball game and a bunch of people going to, I think it was Comic-Con or something. I live in New York. Um, so you see all kinds on the train um, of, of fun outfits. But, you know, the people who were wearing the sports outfits were making fun of the people who were dressed up, uh, you know, very doing various cosplay. And my boyfriend was like, are you kidding me? You're dressed like sports players. Like, and he's a huge sports fan. Like he loves baseball. He loves sports. But he was like, you're literally cosplaying your favorite baseball player right now. And you're making fun of people for cosplaying their favorite comic book character. Like, please take several seats. For sure. Well, it is getting about time for us to wrap up. Thank you so much to our wonderful non-autistic panelists. This has been honestly just an incredible amount of fun. Um, and just like genuinely valuable learning experience, but also I had a great time hanging out with you all. Um, Haley is gonna drop a link in the Zoom chat um, where people can go for our next thing, which is in just a few minutes, um, we're gonna have a short video about um, our Autism Campus Inclusion Summer Leadership Program. And then we will have a, a Julia speech, Julia Bascom, our executive director, um, her speech is uh, one of the highlights of the gala every year. So I'm um, really looking forward to that. Um, that'll be streaming on YouTube. You can get the link um, in the Zoom here or on our Twitter um, or in your program. If you got a gala program email to you, um, our Zoom chat is just bubbling over right now about how inspiring and brave all of our wonderful non-autistic panelists are. And I could not agree more. Um, here is my dog. If you haven't checked off being a pet on your ASA and Gala Bingo, you can now. Thank you, wonderful panelists, and thank you, wonderful attendees, um, and hope everyone is having a great gala. Bye. Bye.